It's good to see everybody today. We're in this study in which we're asking, okay, we believe these things as followers of Jesus. How does that become a part of our life? How does it sort of get out of our heads and into our hands and our feet and the way we live every day? And we're in the fundamental part at the very beginning and sort of just like a little bit of a warning, this is the hardest passage in this whole book, okay? And so if you understand this, please see me later. Okay, I'd like to have some of it explained to me. But we need to go through it together, and I think you'll see why it's so critical for us to know and where it leads for us. Okay, so it's in your program. You'll see an insert in there that has the outline on one side, and, and on the other side it has the text, and, um, and it's also here on the wall behind me. And we, we stay with the biblical text. We really want to listen to God. We want to listen to His Word. We need to hear His voice. So this is the word of God. The Apostle Apostle Paul writing, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit." The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ. Let's pray. Father, we do need to be led by You. Your Word says that we see through a glass darkly, that it's as if we're in a dark room and we're trying to make our way through it, bumping into things and wondering how we can go forward. And so, Father, I pray that as we come together today that you'll show us how it's, it's possible, how you plan to lead us to this life that you have for us in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for calling us together. We we long to hear from you. We want to know how you would lead us. And we thank you and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You ever been lost? No, no, I mean like really raw, lost. Richard Van Pham, that's his name, a few years ago set out in his 26-foot sailboat from Long Beach, California. I mean, he was going out for sailing 
for the day. And he didn't know what was going to happen. He got out from land and he came into the midst of a storm that demasted. It broke the mast of his boat. His outboard motor wasn't working and he was adrift. Now, I'm not like talking about adrift for a couple of days. He was adrift for almost four months. Imagine that. Catching rainwater in a bucket, trapping turtles that came up to his boat because they were curious about what it was, and catching fish. He managed to survive, and every day he scanned the horizon for any sign of somebody who might be able to help him. One day this plane flies over, and, and, and he waves, and they see him. Two hours later, this arrives. Can you imagine that? This is the 453-foot McCluskey, a U.S. guided missile frigate, rescued him 300 miles off the coast of Costa Rica. He had traveled about 2,500 miles. The ship's commander, when they picked him up, said, it's a three-hour cruise gone bad. Duh, right? It's like a cross between Gilligan's Island and Robinson Crusoe. And interestingly enough, when you read the story, it's like amazing. When they came up to this guy in his boat, you'll see a picture in his boat here, and they actually board it together. He said, no, no, I don't want you to rescue me. Could you help me fix my mask? And could you help me get my, my outboard motor going? And they're like, well, you know you're 300 miles from land, right? And, um, and you know you don't know what you're doing here. Graciously... They took him off the boat and they sunk the boat. And then the sailors on the frigate, they took up a collection so that he could take a flight from Costa Rica home. What is an incredible odyssey. And as I read this story, I mean, all of us in some way can, can, we know the feeling of being lost. Maybe it happened for you as a little child, your mother or your father released your hand for just a moment in the mall and for, the, for a moment there's like a feeling of terror. For us as adults, it's usually not terror. It's like, where am I? Where am I going? How, how am I going to get there? Am I really where I want to be in my life? And these are, these are the basic questions for anyone going on a voyage, right? And we've been talking about how 1 Corinthians is this life. It's this voyage. We ask, where are we going? And how am I going to get there? How will I get there? Now, here's the problem today where we live in the culture that we live in. We do not have a reliable way of answering the most important questions of life. And what's worse is you're basically told you have to figure it out for yourself. Now, to sort of understand this, during the time of Jesus, all of the most important questions that a young person had to answer going into adulthood that now we lay upon young people to answer for themselves, they were answered for you. Who will I worship? What will I do with my life? Who will I marry? Where will I live? Your family had this figured out. Local, uh, usually in the community you were living in, your parents were a part of choosing your spouse, whoever that might be. You did the work that your family did. You lived on the ancestral land and inherited it into your future. You see, today, none of these questions are answered for you. It's laid upon you the responsibility of figuring all of this out. So where are you going? And what is your life going to be about? Who will you follow? Where will you live? Who will you marry? And this is what explains this modern feeling of lostness that people say that they feel today. The overwhelming feeling that we, we're hearing as we listen to sociologists is that people feel adrift. Like they're just floating along, doing what you have to do next to get through another day, just charting a little bit further moving ahead. I remember when I moved to the Northeast, being from Florida, I lived in denial. I was in a place where it was cold. So I leave my house. I wouldn't wear a jacket. And some mornings I would get up and my car windshield looked like this. And it was like, I'm in defiance of the fact that I'm where it snows. I'm just going to drive. You know, that doesn't work when you can't see out your windshield, okay? But that's the reality of the experience of people today. How am I going to drive when I can't see where I'm going, what this is all supposed to be about, I am not so sure about, and I have to figure this out on my own. 
So what do we do? We experiment with a lot of things because we don't know. And even the experimentation doesn't lead to all of the answers. We distract ourselves from thinking about the real important questions of life. We, we sort of immerse ourselves in the mundane and the trivial because we've lost connection with the eternal. So we fill our lives with things, anything to make us feel alive, to feel like our life is significant, it's important, and, and our, our, that our life has meaning, that there is a purpose. But if we are honest, this only goes so far. This struck me a few weeks ago. Sandy and I were visiting my daughter and son-in-law and our two grandchildren in St. Louis, and I get up before everybody else does, so I shoot off to Starbucks. Okay, I can pray there, I can read, I can write, I can get some coffee, you know. And it was one of those weeks when Starbucks was doing their limited time offer of drinks. Okay, maybe you heard about this. The drink that week was called the Unicorn Frappuccino. Did you hear about that? And so here I'm sitting in here reading, and people are coming in. They want to get one of these. Now, they're all natural, by the way, but they have this much sugar. They have the equivalent in a medium size of 15 teaspoons of sugar. The amount that you need for a whole day and a half. I didn't even want to ask what the Vinti or Large had. Maybe you see this. Maybe you tried it. And it's supposed to change flavors as you're drinking it. It looks like this. This didn't look like natural coloring to me, but that's what I was told. And so here I was watching people come in and get it, and all I could think of, this is what I was thinking. I was like, we're now chasing unicorns. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and uh, to not to be a fraud, personally, I have to say, maybe I'm not chasing unicorns, but I'm chasing Apple devices. Or I'm chasing the next sports thing. And the trivial has just filled our lives and we're doing all this stuff and it's tr we're trying to make our, feels, our life feel alive and we are not answering the important questions of life. Our text today is about the biggest questions of life, about our navigational equipment, about what God has given us to find our way. How can I know my purpose? How sh what is the direction I should be heading in my life? And how am I going to get there? And that's what I want to talk about today, navigating life with grace. Now, I was really upfront about this text. This is the most difficult chapter in this book. It is very difficult to understand. And, and the reason, and by the way, commentators have wrestled with this for centuries. And I think it's for this reason. Paul struggles in the culture that he's coming from putting into words what we need to know about how to go forward. And the reason is this. In Jewish culture, if you ask the question, what is my life to be like? How am I going to get there? What is it all going to be about? The answer was really simple. He would say something like this. Look, you want to know what your life is to be like? It is really easy. Look at the law. That will tell you everything. That was the stock Jewish answer. And by the way, that word doesn't appear in this chapter. It is not here. He says, you don't have to figure anything out. It is there in plain black and white. God tells you what he wants and what he expects. Now go and do it. Follow the steps. Work your program. But you see, Paul knew this. He had done this personally. He was like the overachiever, poster child of law keeping. And when he gets to tell his own story, he would say, hey, I kept the law. I did all these things. But let me tell you, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I was a violent man. And this means you can be very religious. You can do all kinds of good things like coming to church and giving money and serving. You can be a good and moral person and still be a long way away from God. You can be far from God and be doing all of those good things. They are not enough. First, it's sort of like a map. You know, the law sort of works like a map, and, and there are things you learn if you're navigating about maps. First, you learn that um, all maps, none of them are complete. Those who make maps, they have to choose what information to put in them. Now, it happened to me recently. I was downtown walking the city, and I pulled up Google Maps, and I had that on my phone, and I was walking along, and something that, that Google said was a street actually became no more than a sidewalk at one point. And I was like, what? Google could be wrong about something? you got to be kidding me. 
right? That's the deity that we go and ask the questions of life. You know, we Google it up, and, and that's what we think the way it is. But that's the reality of maps. Map cannot give you all the information. It's not complete. And so the reality of this is that there are many things there are many things that you, that, that you haven't learned for a life that you have to live. There are things that, that the law, that the map, if it's not in your playbook, that you're going to encounter in your life. They won't be in your map. The second thing is maps become dated. They become very dated. I was reading about this couple. They, they were coming on a trip here to Miami. A lot of people vacation here. We had some cruise goers who were at our early service. Well, they flew into Miami, and before they got on the plane, the friends that drove them that said, oh, we were at Miami a few years ago, and we had this map. You know, you can have Google and stuff, but you need, if you open up a map, you'll get a better lay of the land. So they land in Miami International Airport. They get on a taxi, and they're driving out of the airport, and the guy opens the map, and he's like, I'm not sure, I, I don't know, I'm not finding a connection between this map and what I'm seeing. And he turned it over, and he found copyright 1985, okay? Now, that might work in London. Those streets haven't changed probably since 1685. But here in Miami, you cannot use a 1985 map. The reality is things are going to happen in your life going forward that whatever map you've chosen for yourself today, it's not going to do it, okay? You're going to encounter things you didn't plan for, and whatever you've chosen your map to be. But here's the most immense problem of the law. And it's the problem with every map. It can show you the lay of the land, but it can't get you there. It can't get you to that destination, right? And that was true of the law. It could tell you what life would look like, but it couldn't empower you to fulfill it. So what does Paul give us here? He doesn't say, hey, just look at the map. Look at the law. Well, these are the ingredients that we basically need for navigation. We need to first know where we are right? Then we need to know where we're going. And in the most simple sense, we need to know, okay, how am I going to navigate there? How am I going to get there? Okay? And those are the things he gives here. He says, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom. He says, look, let me give it to you in a nutshell. This is all about Christ and what he has done for you and learning God's way from the Spirit of God, not based on your human wisdom. If you build your life only on human wisdom, you're going to be in trouble. This will only take you so far. You need God's power. And so that's really sort of the first thing that I hear. It's your orientation. Where are you now? In navigation, that's what it's called. You sort of orient yourself. Okay, where, where am I before I decide how I'm going to get where I need to go? And let me just say, in our world, we don't believe this. We believe we can navigate our lives without any reference to God, that we don't need Him. We can figure it out. We are smart enough. We can apply ourselves. Maybe we need more time and education, but we will get there. Listen to the writer of the Proverbs. Those who trust in themselves are fools. Let me say that again. Those who, who trust in themselves are fools. We're foolish just to look to ourselves. You know, we may need to experience this. The closing chapter of Tim Keller's most recent book, Making Sense of God, tells about a guy who was brilliant. He went to Harvard. He graduated with honors. He came from a very bright family. And after he graduated from Harvard, he went to China to teach English. And he was out in the middle of nowhere in China, and one day Japanese soldiers had overrun that part of the country, and what they did was they took him and the other Americans, and there were some British and other, you know, outsiders, and they put him under house arrest. You'll see a picture of him as an older guy. His name is Langdon Gilkey. And, and then what they did was they gathered 2,000 from a region, and they put him into a, a, a compound together, and Langdon was like, this is awesome. What we can do is we have a small group of people. We have a new place. We can, we can have a little micro community here. 
This will be the place where we can see how human sharing and ingenuity and cooperation will make everything work. Every, this is going to be great. It will prove what I've always felt about my life. This is the perfect incubator for human life. Well, let me tell you, there were 2,000 people in this compound. It was not a very pretty place. And there were 20 toilets. I know the ladies are thinking lines are long, right? Where you use the restroom. There were 20 toilets for 2,000 people. And you know what was really amazing? For the first like 90 days, people cooperated. They used their abilities for each other. But as life began to get hard in the compound, something began to happen. Slowly, reality began to sink in, and it became about survival, and fights started breaking out over food. There was violence. People would get hurt. Things would be stolen. The, the weak were taken advantage of. And you know what? Nothing could be done to stop the violence. And here was this guy who said, you know what, we can do it ourselves. We can put together a, a culture, a society, and this is a perfect opportunity to do this. He realized that the little civilization didn't work. He said, quote, it threatened the very existence of our community, the way everybody was living. And so what he did was this. He said, okay, I'm going to bring all of the powers of human persuasion and logic. I'm going to sit down with these people who are stealing with each other and explain to them logically why this is a bad idea, that you can't really be selfish and have this work. He did all of this but the difficulties of the compound exposed needs so deep and the brokenness of the human heart that nothing worked. And so what he did was he began backtracking and saying, what does it take for people to live in community? How is this ever to be possible? And this is what he said. He concluded, human beings need God because their precarious and contingent lives can find final significance only in his almighty and eternal purposes. And because their fragmentary lives must find their ultimate center only in his transcendent love. You see, he discovered that it wasn't food or, or bathrooms that were the problem. It was the human heart. It wasn't that they didn't know enough. They were living for themselves alone. And the result of trying to survive was they would destroy each other. And he could see this as he looked. He said, if man's ultimate loyalty is centered in themselves, then the effect of their lives on others around them will be destructive on that community on which we all depend. Only in God is there ultimate loyalty that does not breed injustice and cruelty. So he said, look, if you are not out there navigating with God, the community of, the, of human beings does not have a chance. Our nature will drive us against each other and destroy the community all of us need. And the problem is, that's where we are in our culture. That's where we live every day. Loyal to self, drawing our identity from ourselves. And it's so obvious. You know, I think it's even so obvious. It's hard to believe life could be any other way, isn't it? We've been so immersed in this. David Foster Wallace said over 10 years ago, he's a great writer, at an address that he gave at commencement this time of the year. This is what he said. He said, everything in my own immediate experience supports my deep belief that I am the absolute center of the universe. We rarely talk about this sort of natural, basic self-centeredness because it's so socially repulsive. But it's our default setting, hardwired into our boards at birth. Think about it. There's no experience that you've had that you were not at the absolute center of. The world as you experience it is right there in front of you or behind you, to the left or right of you, or on your TV, on your monitor, and so on. So other people's thoughts and feelings have to be communicated to you somehow, but your own are so immediate, urgent, and real. That's what we feel. They're just so real. They're so urgent. And this is why we are so stuck. It's, why we're, we're, it's as if we're stuck in ourselves. Paul has it, says it like this in his letter. He says, the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age that are, that are coming to nothing. He says, this is the outcome of this life. So the first thing we need is God. We, we need God in order to have a sense of purpose and significance. So if you want to take an orientation lesson of where you are, you are this person every day that is, is in need of God in your life. I am in need of God. 
And the gospel is all about this. The gospel says God has written his son into the story of our world to bring you into communion with him so that you can have the life that he created you to have. He gives us our value and a sense of mission in the world. And you say, okay, okay, I, I, I can begin to get that. I, I feel that internally. But where is God calling me? What is our destination? If this is who I am, I'm needing God every day. What direction is he calling me to go? Now, there's no sense in going anywhere if you don't have a destination. Where are we going? Listen to Paul again. However as it is written... What no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. And I read that and I say, yeah, what kind of good is that to me now? He's saying, look, what God has prepared for us, you can't conceive of this. You can't know this. People have never conceived of this. I say, hold on a minute. I want to know where he's calling me. How am I supposed to see this? We, we want to know what the mystery is. We want to know what be, is behind the curtain and what, where God is calling us. What is the thing that is beyond us? He's been telling us in every page. It's the cross of Jesus. It's where the wisdom and foolishness of God come together. It's where the strength of God is seen in human weakness. So you say, well, what does God have prepared for us? For goodness sakes, this isn't about heaven and eternity. Although those things you can't imagine too. He is trying to equip people to live today. God's plan for us has to do with the cross and the emergence of women and men who embody, that is, live in their bodies the life that Jesus showed us and he showed us there. That means God's strength in your weakness, God's wisdom in your foolishness. You are to become like Jesus This is your destination. And by the way, this is repeated all over the place in the New Testament. You're called the fullness in Christ. You're being conformed to the image of Christ. And you can't fathom this, as Paul says, because we couldn't see the wisdom of God in Jesus' weakness, right? God's plan is to bond you to himself and to give you a life you could not conceive of. In Christ, he is not looking for soldiers to line up And to walk lockstep with some law, he is bringing men and women to himself to walk in his love and live in his truth and have the life that he created us as human beings to have in the very beginning. Well, you say, what does that mean? This life that nobody has seen. Years ago, it happened actually in December of 2013. This was really sort of illustrated for me. There's an article that came out about an American, actually he's from Texas, who was living in Benghazi. I know if you think about those dates, 2011 when the, the embassy attack happened, their consulate attack happened, and the ambassador was killed. So why is this guy, his name is Ronnie Smith, his wife is Anita, you'll see a picture of them, and here's with their son Hosea. What are they doing in Benghazi? Well, he is teaching at the international school that is there. You'll see a picture of it. After the ambassador was killed, two years before all of the Americans left, or almost all of them, Ronnie and Anita and their child stayed. And here's what one of the students at the school said. He was the most amazing person, more like a best friend or a family member. After everything that happened in Libya, we were losing hope, and he was the only one who was supporting us. What are they doing in Benghazi? Yes, he is a Christian. And yes, he had been warned about the security consequences of being there. But he talked it over. They talked about it together. They prayed about it. Sadly, on December 5th, 2013, Ronnie was doing what he did like five mornings a week. He was out for his morning jog when he was gunned down. Less than two weeks later, Anita, his wife, wrote an open letter to the Libyan people. It wasn't filled with anger over what had happened. It spoke only of love and forgiveness. This is what she said in part. To his attackers, I love you and forgive you. How could I not? For Jesus taught us to love our enemies, not to kill them or seek revenge. Jesus sacrificed his life out of love for the very people who killed him. 
His death and resurrection opened the door for us to walk on the straight path to God in peace and forgiveness. And let me tell you what happened. This is the amazing thing. This was shown on TV all over the Middle East. She went on to TV and shared her letter in Arabic. Here's a picture of her going on TV. Libya, Egypt, Kuwait, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, these were places where this was shown on TV. And let me tell you this, they've seen people show up with guns and armored personnel carrier and tanks, but they had ne never seen anything like this. The people of that community in Benghazi were blown away, and they saw Jesus. Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard what God has planned. For those who love him, who are his people. Now, folks, our destination is not all to a death like this. We're not called to be heroes in this way. And you need to know, Ronnie didn't plan to do that. He was just following his calling. He was a great neighbor in Benghazi. He loved his neighbors where he lived. He lived out the life of Jesus. And when it was all over, people said, we've never seen anything like that. And when his wife poured out forgiveness on the people and loved them after what had happened, they said, we've never heard of anything like that. You see what happens when led by the Spirit of God, as we're being called to fullness in Christ, we live the values we live, how we love one another, how we love in our community. You see, that's our destination. You see, you say, okay, okay, that, that's pretty big. How am I going to get there? How am I going to navigate to this place if it's not following a set of laws and a rule book? And this is the hard part of this chapter. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Now, we stumble all over that. And let me tell you, when we see that word spiritual, it just is sort of like fuzzy for us. Oh, I'm feeling spiritual. Or he's a spiritual person. But literally, here it means of the Spirit. Or in this case, of the Spirit of God. This is talking about an, an intimate connection that God gives us to himself, not through his law, but in relationship with him through his spirit. And this is how we get there. Okay, so what is the spirit? And how can I follow the spirit, you ask? Paul explains it like this. He says, for who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? This is the way I think about it, if you stay with me. It works like this. I am a person. My name is Worth Carson. And I have thoughts. They are a part of me and they represent me. And by the way, you're hearing some of my thoughts in this message. And you can't really know me unless you know my thoughts. But I, myself, I and my thoughts are not one. They're not identical. Now, I also have a spirit. And by the way, if you talk to my wife or kids or people who know me, they will probably better be able to describe my own spirit than I can. It sort of reflects the essence of who I am. And so I have these parts, and so do you, these three parts. I have thoughts, I have a spirit, I am a person. God made you this way. God himself is this way. In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So here's, here's God in three person, and God has thoughts that have taken on flesh and blood in the person of Jesus, the living Word. But God also has, has a Spirit, and His Spirit, wow, it has the deep things of God, Paul says, the thoughts of God. Now here's the thing, for navigation and empowering, what God has said this is, look, the law may be a good map, but I've given you my spirit, the presence of my spirit to guide and empower you because God wants you to know him and, and you can't get there on your own. He gives us his spirit to teach us and guide us into truth, to lead us from here to there, to get a life we could not imagine on our own in his power, in his wisdom. You see, God makes this possible. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, Paul says, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. Okay, 
I need to tell you a little bit more about Richard Van Pham's story. Remember the guy, 26-foot sailboat, lost for almost four months, 2,500 miles away from home? Here's his picture. When he got back to Southern California, there was an outpouring of support for him. Some people gave him money, and the coolest part was a guy showed up and he said, look, I want to give you a new boat. I'm going to give you a new boat. I'm going to give you everything you need. I'm going to take care of you. And by the way, I'm going to make sure it's equipped with a radio, flares, compass, and even a GPS. The whole deal so that he couldn't get lost. True story. Almost exactly one year after the first rescue, he was picked up about 30 miles off of Long Beach in this boat by the Coast Guard. Now, the Coast Guard commander said he, he was lost and disoriented. He told us he left Long Beach three days ago and was in the process of trying to make his way back. But the thing was, the boat was headed out to sea and not toward land. And I thought about that. Now, the man who gave him the boat heard about this, and he said, I'm sad to hear he's confused and disoriented. If he used the navigational equipment I gave him, he wouldn't have been lost. Duh, right? And that's really our part. God has called us to himself, and he said, look, I'm going to provide you what you need. Yeah, you're going to have a map. That's not the most important part. That's good. But I'm going to give you my spirit. I'm, that's why Jesus came, to bond you to me so that I, you, you could walk with me. You could know my presence. You could seek wisdom and direction and instruction from me. Not focusing on the law again, but seeking Jesus. And I love the way that this whole passage ends. It's sort of really abrupt. He says, but we have the mind of Christ. He said, add to boot. You not only have the Spirit of God, you, you know Jesus. You can, you can read about him. You can know him personally. We have seen Jesus. So I want to ask where you are today. How much in your life are you, for, are you being honest about orienting yourself where you are in your need of God? And then second, you know this destination, a life of walking with God, that you were meant to fullness in Christ, to manifest the presence of God. And then finally, is, is the nav equipment turned on? Are you listening? Are you seeking? Are you asking? Father, thank you that we can be here together today. And really, Lord, there, I can't imagine, I can't think of a culture from my reading of history that is more adrift than ours. Lord, we're experimenting with everything, everything but you. We're seeking everything, trying everything, but not acknowledging our need of you. And so I pray, Father, every day as a people we'll do that. We will start with a place that, that we say, I need you, Lord. Speak to me, lead me by your Holy Spirit. Show me what I'm called to be, the, the calling that you've given me to reflect who Jesus is. Because I have your Spirit, and Jesus has come for me. And I thank you and I pray in Jesus' name, amen.